So, hello everyone. Uh, you can hear me well, right? Yeah. Okay then. So, when I was first approached to present a TED Talk to this event, I was flattered. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to pretend that, oh, I didn't have any ideas to talk about during this event. As a matter of fact, quite, quite the opposite. I had quite a lot of ideas, like since I was a TED advisor at this club since 2018. So I watched many presentations over time, and that allowed me to have uh, many ideas of my own. And the problem is that I was overwhelmed because I couldn't choose which one to talk about. And this is where a lot of trouble comes in. Because usually when a speaker comes to the TED Talk, they will usually talk about their works or their passions. And the problem is that if I were to talk about the first one, this will become a chemistry lesson and will probably lose the attention of half of you. And if we're talking about the second one, then you would have to, to endure me talking about my passion for history, books, role-playing games, video games, and then I will lose the other half of you. So I will try to find the region where these two things would overlap with each other. And this is where it hit me. The, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, the thing is that I, I am a teacher, as you are aware of here. And the thing is that I, I spend most of my time with teenagers here. And that got me to, th to thinking about human behavior. And since I deal with science, I got this insight that might be, how can I say, outrageous, might be surprising to some of you, but this insight is that scientists are human too. And in order for me to have some degree of uh, credibility with this wild claim, I will not treat this as a TED talk. I'm going to treat this as a scientific thesis. So as any scientific thesis, I would have to have my own methodology. So here's what I came up with, my flawless methodology to prove that scientists are human too. So step one, I would try to, wait a second, I gotta read that, yes. So I try to find what are the characteristics that make humans human, right? That seems reasonable. Uh, and given the fact that I am a teacher who spends most of his time with teenagers who happen to be young humans, then uh, I could observe them in their natural habitat, which is the school, and then try to find what are the characteristics that make them so. The next step would be to look into scientists and see if they display also these characteristics. And then, therefore, by proving that scientists have these human characteristics, therefore I would prove that they are humans too. So, success and applause. This is the five steps for my methodology. So, after tons of observation, Insight with my uh, my subjects, so to say, and after also reading lots of articles and stories about other scientists, and tons and tons of writing and rewriting of the script to try to make it entertaining and funny, this is what I came up with. So I tried to find the extremes of uh, the human the human expression or the human experience. Uh, so when I was looking at the teenagers, one thing that I noticed, and one thing that we can notice, is that if you put a group of teenagers together for quite an extended period of time, this means they have to live with each other day after day for a few years, you notice that one thing will come up. There will be rivalries between them. So they can be nasty to each other sometimes. So if I could prove that scientists also can have rivalries like that, that will make me one step closer to proving that scientists are human. So for that, I chose a story of these two guys, which are, sorry, that is Humphrey Davy and Michael Farley with their own rivalries. So let's start with this one here, Humphrey Davy, or poor old Humphrey Davy. Let's call him Dave for now, just to make it uh, easier for us to, to relate to them. So the thing about Dave is that he was already a notable scientist at his time, working in London. Uh, he had already, uh, he was dealing with this new thing called electricity, and he managed to create the most powerful electrical battery that was in Europe at the time. And with that battery and the power of this electricity, he managed to discover several chemical elements that were not known back then. So he had already established himself as somewhat famous. And uh, <clears throat> the 
thing is that he also uh, was helpful not only in the field of uh, electrochemistry and with physics, he also discovered, for example, the, the properties of, of, of the laughing gas. This is nitro uh, dinitrogen oxide. Uh, and, well, he was already established back then. And then we can talk about our next character, which is Michael Faraday, or Mike for short. So Mike was quite the opposite of Dave. The thing is that while, while Dave had it all, he was already uh, quite rich because he, of all the awards that he won, he had already uh, did, he was he had already done some work to help with the living quality in London, and he also invented a lamp called the Dave lamp which was used to, well, light up caves and mines and so on, especially helping coal miners uh, and those miners who had to work in environments where there were like flammable gases and they could not use fire lamps, they had to use something else, in this case electricity. So he got quite, quite rich and he was like detached from his money because he didn't need it. And on the other hand, Mike was a poor boy from a poor family. He didn't have a formal education, and in his teen years, he worked as a, an assistant at a bookstore. So quite a humble beginning. <coughs> and the thing is that while he was working at the bookstore, Mike had this wide interest in science. So he devoured every chemistry and physics book that he could find. Uh, and this got the attention of his boss, because sometimes he would be reading instead of working in organizing the books in the library or in the bookstore. And as a gift, his boss at the bookstore got him a ticket to go or to attend a scientific lecture uh, where certain scientists will be talking about their words and so on. And Mike was ecstatic, he was very happy that he could have this opportunity. So he went there, he took his notepad so that he could take some notes. And it was there that Mike met Dave. So Dave was there, he was giving some lectures about his work. And the thing is that Dave had like a, a, a minor inconvenience, he was blinded, you know, like he did some experiments uh, in the laboratory and he ended up blind for a few weeks, as you do, you know, like things that we do every day, right? So, as he lectured, uh, in the end, as they had like a coffee break, like the one that we had just now, uh, Mike went to talk to Dave, and Dave, while blind, got impressed that this little teenager, this like person who didn't even have 18 years old, uh, he was impressed by his uh, comprehension of physics and chemistry. And because of that, uh, Dave got Mike to be his assistant in the laboratory because he needed someone to be his eyes. And that's where their partnership began. Uh, so in this case, Mike uh, started to learn more and more about science, about physics and chemistry, while under the tutelage of Dave. And with that, Mike, over the years, he went from a uh, boy with no formal education to becoming a huge name in science with major contributions to chemistry, to electromagnetism, uh, to becoming a professor at universities and so on. Uh, so, you might be thinking now, but wait, you said that this would be about rivalries. And this story is getting like, too happy for my taste. And hold on, the plot thickens, so we have to, you do not have to wait too much to see that. Uh, the thing is that this success from Mike got uh, Dave with a little, uh, how can I say, pettiness, you know? How dare Mike become even more famous? How dare he overcome his mentor and become like even more famous than, than Dave? And this is where they start to bicker with each other. And especially, Mike uh, starts to get boycotted by Dave's influence, because he was quite influential with other scientists and with the scientific community as a whole. So he ended up uh, blocking many opportunities that Mike had of getting funds and grants for his research. So what happened is that Mike basically ended up having to do his own individual res independent research in his free time, uh, which he did. He made the best that he could. But the thing is that Dave managed to close many doors to Mike and he would have even more success if it were not for his boycotts. So quite a petty, um, uh, development in their relationship. and But this has um, a nice ending because as we see sometimes with teenagers as well, these robbers sometimes they can reconcile, they can make peace with each other. And that's what happened. Over the years, they let go of their feelings towards each other, they managed to get in touch with each other. Uh, maybe they've got a conscience or maybe he uh, 
I don't know, left off his ego. But eventually they started to hang out together again and to have friendly talks. And that got to the point that in one of his last interviews before he died, Dave, now 50 years old, he was asked what he thought was his greatest discovery in the field of science. And his answer was Michael Faraday. So yeah, that was a nice way to talk about this first aspect. So I just managed to prove that science is at least a display some rivalry. So that's one extreme of the human spectrum that I have really proved that they possess. Now, if we go to the other side, another thing that I thought that when looking at my teenage subjects uh, is that they not only display rivalries between themselves, but they have friendships. They have uh, they grow fond of each other, they create bonds with each other. And that brought me to the second component, or the second characteristics that I'm going to evaluate, to evaluate which is uh, companionship. And I'm not saying companionship just in terms of, uh, in limited terms, we can go for broader terms. So the way that we create bonds with our friends, with our families, with our classmates, or with our uh, colleagues from work, or for example, the way that we have uh, romantic love, or that we create bonds with the people we have, that we got involved with. So if I could manage that scientists, per chance, they display some companionship, that will prove the other spectrum, oh sorry, that spectrum of the human uh, experience. And I had some examples to look over to do this, and the ones that I chose were the Lavoisiers. So this is the story of Antoine Lohan and Marie I probably butchered their names, I don't know French. But Let's call them, for short, just to make it simpler, uh, let's call them Tony and Mary, okay? Let's make it easier for me, for us to relate to them, to treat them as human beings, right? Uh, so the thing is that, let's start with Mary, just to be a little, uh, to make a twist on what this story usually goes like. So you see, Mary was a very smart girl, and a very determined one at that. Uh, she was the daughter of a man called Jack, or Jacques, and he worked at a, a tax collecting firm. So basically the French crown, they would pay some companies to do tax collecting in their stead. And Jacques, or Jack, was the boss of one of these firms. And the thing is that Jack had some connections with the French nobility. And one of these was a baroness, and this baroness had a, bo a brother that she really wanted to get married. And that's when uh, Mary's father was hard pressured to try to marry her to the Baroness's brother. There were just a few problems with this. You see, the Baroness's brother was 50 years old, and Mary was 13 years old. And not only that, but according to Mary, and this is recorded, uh, like there are notes of this discussion, according to Mary, the Baroness's brother was a fool and a uh, unfeeling rustic and an ogre. So that's not quite flattering, right? <coughs> and the thing is that Jack, he really liked his, his daughter. He wanted her to be happy. And, if, and unfortunately, he could not say no to the Baroness, because otherwise he would get in trouble, because she was very influential. So they tried to devise a plan to avoid the marriage. So here's the thing, there's like a plot that looks like a, a Hollywood romantic comedy, you know? She couldn't get married to the Baroness's brother if she was already married to someone else. So this is where Jack, he found the perfect candidate for that. This, uh, young, this brilliant and handsome young man who worked for him in his tax collecting firm called Tony. And he introduced the two of them. They got along quite well. And the reasons why uh, Tony was the perfect match for that is because he was 25 years old. So, no, sorry, 20, no, 25 years old. So half the age of the Baroness's brother. Uh, he was, as I said, handsome. He was a gentleman. He was a sensitive, sensitive person. He was a humanist. He had already uh, delved into projects to help in the uh, hygiene and urban lighting in Paris to aid the lives of Paris citizens. And also he had a law degree. So quite a match for her. And when they were introduced, Mary saw the little laboratory that uh, Tony had in his house, where he would do this hobby of his with science. And she got impressed, she got like uh, very uh, interested in that. 
this part, this interest of Mary, not only into science, but also in Tony himself. So that's when they, they put their plans to action. The two had already grown fond of each other in the few weeks that they had met each other. And in a rush, like in less than a month, they had already gotten married. And then unfortunately, Mary couldn't marry the, the Baroness's brother. And she was saved from that, from the unfilling over. And this is where their partnership actually started. Because when they got married, uh, the couple, they received money from Mary's father, which is called a dowry, which is where the parent pays the couple when the daughter gets married. And what did they do with all this money? They got quite a large sum of that. Did they buy a house? Did they travel for Europe? None of that. They built a huge and well-equipped laboratory. So, like, they, just, they had this partnership even in science. And with that, it became a scientific powerhouse because with Lavoisier's already, oh, sorry, with Tony's already uh, well-established uh, influence with the scientific community and his uh, knowledge acquired over the years, combined with Mary's linguistic skills, because she knew more than half of the languages in Europe, they were able not only to translate Tony's works into other languages, but also to get works from different languages translated into French so that they could read together. So they became a, a major force to be reckoned with in the science community at the time. And from this couple, from this union, uh, a child was born, and this, born, this child was called chemistry, which is a field that aids us in the understanding of the universe around us, and also provides me with a paying job, which is good, a good plus. And, well, this is a story. They were happily wed, something that is very rare for their times in the 18th century. Uh, and I think, oh, Flavio, this story is very heartwarming. It's very cool. I wonder how it ends. And things that this painting that you're looking at right now, it was finished the day before the French Revolution started. And if there was one thing that the people in the French Revolution didn't like was nobles. And alongside them, tax collectors. So you see where this is going. Uh, Tony got a few months or maybe a year of peace, but eventually he was uh, sent to the guillotine because he was working or he had already worked with uh, collecting taxes from the people and aiding the crown. So yeah, that's how their relationship ended. Their, their wedding or their marriage was cut off when Tony's head was cut off as well. Uh, yeah, that's a downer, sorry about that. But anyways, despite that, I have proved that scientists are able to display companionship among them. So let's summarize the progress that we have so far. So first, humans are able to have rivalries, scientists are able to have rivalries, humans are able to reconcile, scientists, oh sorry, scientists are able to reconcile, humans have companionship, and scientists also have companionship. Is that appearing right? Yes, okay. So therefore, I would say that mission accomplished. I managed to prove that scientists are indeed human. Yay, awesome, nice job. So why did we choose this specific topic for me to talk about during this TED talk? Uh, is it because I like gossip and I like to talk about the private lives of other people? Uh, yes, yes I do. But not only that. The thing is that uh, when we talk about scientists in media, if I were to ask someone on the street for them to picture a scientist, they would probably think about a mad scientist, like a person with grizzled hair and these glasses and it doesn't speak very coherently. Or they would figure a socially awkward uh, kid who is very bright and speaks only about science the whole time. And this is spread in many like media, like movies, uh, series, cartoons, video games and so on. But the last thing that they will think about when, they, when you want them to picture a scientist is an actual person. A person who has family, a person who has children, a person who has bills to pay, a person who is uh, anxious because they need to uh, get a certain uh, amount of productivity to, to keep their research grants and their funding and so on. Uh, because the way that it is today, scientists in order for them to afford their living, they keep to have producing, uh, producing articles, producing knowledge and so on. 
uh, constantly. And when we're dealing with a, a, a branch of people who are trying to expand human knowledge beyond what is already known, this kind of pressure doesn't work. We don't, uh, it doesn't work that way if you try to get people to discover new things. So this publish or perish uh, mentality or this publish or perish model, it doesn't work well for them, for their mental health. In fact, there are several studies who talk about or which talk about the mental health of people in academia or scientists. And some of them say, for example, that scientists and graduate students are six times more likely to, than the general population uh, to develop anxiety, depression, uh, and burnout syndrome. And this is before the COVID-19 pandemic, which might have make it, made it even worse with the pressure from governments to try to develop new discoveries that could be helpful in fighting this pandemic. Um, and the same uh, research that I mentioned before uh, said that more than one third of the interviewed uh, people, they already were with some sort of psychological or psychiatric treatment to deal with these conditions. So if I want to, I, if I want you to get something out of this uh, TED talk, apart from the little stories from scientists, is that we need some change. Uh, because scientists, they need uh, to have a more healthy environment for them to be able to afford their lives. Uh, and the only way that we can do that is if we, if we have pressure. And if only they are doing the pressure, uh, it's not, not going anywhere. We need people to get uh, uh, empathize with them and try to fight with them, to, to support their fight for better rights and better conditions. Because then the people who have the power of decision over these things, then they will try to listen, and not only when they are doing the talking. So uh, unless we do something about it, the brilliant minds who constantly are trying to carry our human understanding beyond what is already known, they will always be constantly struggling and constantly on the edge of falling and crumbling through anxiety and despair. Thank you very much.